Here we go. Whoa, hey, where's my face at? There we go. Uh, hey now, it's Brace for Impact, and I'm your host, Mike Gilbert, and I'm going solo on that ass, but it's still the same. We're talking TNA wrestling. I'm also going to get into a little bit of New Japan because I just uh, finished the New Japan Windy City ride. I watched some of it yesterday live. Um, thank you, thank you, Coach Matt, my buddy Matt, for uh, hooking me up with that um, – Hooking me up with that uh, New Japan password. He actually bought the pay per view. I was like, "Oh, cool! I don't have to watch illegally. I can use." You know, my buddy bought it, so that was cool. Uh, so we got coffee for for Matt for hooking that up. Ah, so um, man, there's a lot to talk about in the world of pro wrestling. Um, unfortunately, there's not a lot to talk about in uh, TNA wrestling. There's no excitement going on in the, in the promotion right now, and in fact it um the the product is cold the fan base is a bit cold um you know we just had a big wrestlemania weekend last weekend um aew shot themselves in the foot as cm punk would say they're stepping on their own wieners so um so there's a lot of talk going on about that and with tna nobody's talking about it nobody's nobody's talking about tna um, New Japan just crowned John Moxley as their IWGP champion, so that's a bit controversial, and I have some thoughts about it. And I'm going to get to that at, like at the end of the show after my TNA stuff. Um, I might even switch logos for that. Oh, sorry, that that coffee just hit me different this morning. <laughs> so I, I might even I might even switch logos for that. Um, but you know, it's a uh, it's it's a um, it's a weird time in uh, in TNA because you know we came. We, after Bound for Glory last last October, and the whole TNA rebrand was beginning, there was tons of excitement. People thought this was going to be a viable, like a viable number three. Um, even ta like talent was excited about it. Like people were actively like, it looked like people were actively trying to get out of their contracts or wanting to leave the promotions they were in to be able to at least negotiate with TNA and then hopefully that would give them better negotiating power with WWE or AEW or if at you know worst comes to worst that they could they could uh they could go to TNA and then it would be a viable promotion right and then we get into hard to kill and like all that talk paid off the most successful show in the history of the company going back over 20 years with with a fraction of the budget that Dixie Carter would put into it they had the most successful show in the history of the company. Now, ticket sales wise, you know, they had some bigger shows ticket sale wise, but the biggest pay per view that they ever did is Hard to Kill 2024, and it was uh, it was it was super viable. It was a it was a big time deal, and everybody's excited. And then they get to the Orlando tapings, and the production was awful. Um. Not not by TNA stand like it kind of looks like a normal T like a normal you know Impact Wrestling show TNA show, it looked normal but like in comparison to the other shows it it looks looks bad, right? The snafus that they were having before the rebrand whenever they took that last quarter off, um, were already happening. You know they're not color correcting their cameras, the lighting's bad, um, audio like a lot of times Matthew Raywalt sounds like he's talking into a tin can for some reason they just don't give him a real mic I don't know what's going on with all that um, and it was like oh wow everything they said was going to happen just didn't happen and they're not they're not going for it they're, they just weren't and then shortly after that we find out that Scott DeMore gets fired and it's like whoa, all hell breaks loose and then you know like we're thinking oh this this you know the company's going out of business it's in dire straits it's this it's that and of course, that just that turned out not to be the case. Um, and then all of a sudden, we get we get word that you know Josh Alexander gets his option renewed, and he didn't want his option renewed, and now he's you know baby facing the whole thing. But at the time, it was pretty controversial. Steve Macklin's contract's coming up. Um, he went on a winning streak in Philadelphia, so who knows how that's going to play out? But it, as of right now, he's not um, he's not on the Rebellion pay per view. 
Um, so that, so, you know, that's, uh, that's crazy. Mo Motor City Machine Guns are out. They finished up in the Philly tapings. Um, and so people were getting upset about that. All this chaos surrounding it is not leading to any ratings. They're hardly ever in the top 150. I think they were recently. Um, but even when they are, it's like sub 100,000 viewers, um, which is worse than what they were doing for some of their fourth quarter shows last year, right? Impact Wrestling. We were expecting when TNA Wrestling was coming back that that it would be a more – like I said, I keep using the more viable, but a more viable television product. And it just has not been. Um, it just, it really just hasn't been. And, you know, now we're heading into rebellion and there's no excitement. There isn't. And, um, and, and why is that? Well, look, you know, this week we're going to have Motor City Machine Guns versus the system coming up for the tag team titles. We already know the winner of that because we know the Motor City Machine Guns are out. But they have a stipulation that if Motor City Machine Guns win, then they get to go to, into Rebellion to face Speedball Mountain, right? But we already know the winner of that because we already know that the Motor City Machine Guns are gone. They're done. And so there's no excitement about the tag team title match because, you know, it's like, okay, the guns are out. And who really cares about the system versus Speedball Mountain? I, I, I don't like nobody's getting excited about that. The women's division is so dire that they actually had to bring in bring back Steph Delander, who has already faced Jordan Grace and got her butt kicked. It was a quick match. It wasn't anything special. Jordan beat her. Um, but now they're, they're bringing her in, and she's automatically getting a title shot, despite the fact that she's maybe won one or two matches in the promotion, and now she's getting a title shot on pay-per-view and probably a co-main spot, um, although I would argue that probably Hammerstone versus Josh Alexander should be the, the co-main. Because this knockouts title match, even they did a contract signing this week, and it's like, why are we doing a contract signing for this? Like, <laughs> it's not like this is like a a dream match or a match that's been promoted for months or you know you know what I mean? Like, that's not promoted, but but it's been building up for a long time. Like, she came in, she won a gimmick match. Um, she came in off the street, won a gimmick match, and now now is ending in a rebellion as the number one contender, right? Um, the knockouts division is almost dead, but I, we do have some good news coming up, um, here, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit, but, um, so we're heading into rebellion. There's no excitement. The product is cold and they went back to Las Vegas, uh, three months after they had their most attended show since the Dixie Carter era. Right. And they're, they're not selling tickets. Um, I'll go, I'll go. So my friend, uh, Dobby, the brain Heenan actually did the count yesterday. They're at 520. They're at 520. Um, a week out last time I, they, they were, you know, almost double that. I would probably like a little, you know, like 900, something like that last time, but we're at 520. I get the feeling that they'll do a hard push and they'll get around eight, 900 people in there. Um, may, maybe a thousand, maybe a thousand thousand would be pushing it but they're not those are probably not going to be a lot of sold tickets um as of right now if you're a military veteran or if you're active duty you can go to vettix.com and you can get in for free you just got to pay the service fee which i think is like 15 dollars, which is probably about the same price as that a ticket could cost day of honestly or and i told somebody that lives in vegas like you could probably go to the palms and there'll probably be somebody out there walking around giving out free tickets to try to fill the place up and they've closed off several um several parts of the balcony that were that were open during the last uh during the last show and it is not looking good and i think this pay-per-view is going to die a slow death nobody's excited for moose versus nemeth i like moose's champion i like the system it is it, as far as business wise it's just not working i don't want to put the total blame on the system and moose um for them not drawing I think a lot of it has to do with the chaos and the uncertainty around the company and no, there's no consumer confidence there. Nobody, nobody thinks, um, no, nobody has high hopes for the company going forward. And that, and that's the tough part. And that's the reality that we're facing in. Like we could try to spin it all we want. We can try to say, Oh no, they're cooking. That's the word that people like to use. They're cooking, right? Not at the box office, not in TV ratings. So where are they cooking? Where? Show me the evidence. There's not. There's not, right? Um, 
they got some toys coming out. I'm, I'm, I'd be curious to see how those toys sell, you know? Um, so I, I don't know, man, it's, uh, it is, uh, not looking good. Um, not looking good at all going into rebellion. So I hate to come in and piss in everybody's Cheerios. Um, but that's just, that, that, that's just, that's just the way it is. So, um, the only thing that I'm really excited about for rebellion is, uh, Alexander Hammerstone versus Josh Alexander, the third match, because I think that there are, um, I think that there are that this is probably the best built feud that they've done in a long time. I think they're building up Hammerstone as a legit like heel monster. He's very coming across very much like early like late eighties, early nineties Lex Luger to me. And that's probably because, you know, the the guys who are booking are from that era. You know, like Tommy Dreamer. Like that's kind of what they like. And so they're building him like he's Lex Luger. And I'm like, okay, look, fuck it. Do it. Like do Lex Luger, but do a twist to it. And that's what they're doing. Hammerstone. Um, he's using the torture rack. Um, unfortunately for him, so is Will Hobbs now. And Lex Luger is acknowledging Will Hobbs using it, but he has not acknowledged Hammerstone using it because he probably doesn't know who the fuck Hammerstone is. And he probably doesn't know how to watch TNA. <laughs> so um, yeah, th that that's, that's just the way it is. So, yeah, the only thing that I'm really looking forward to at Rebellion is uh, Hammerstone versus Josh Alexander. I think I think Mustafa Ali versus Jake something is going to be like a good match, but I think we already know the outcome to that because um, you know Mustafa Ali is sticking around for a while. He's our and he's being heavily advertised for the uh, the Against All Odds show in uh, Cicero. So um, yeah, that all all of the, all of that is tough. It's not looking good for TNA. Um, the excite there's no excitement around the company. Uh, unless you're like a super hardcore, like if you're like Yellowbone, who is uh, taking it upon himself to be like a con supporter on Twitter, right? It's like, man, you're really, you're really digging deep there to try to promote this company. <laughs> if, uh, if you, if you're trying to be the con supporter, um, <laughs> so that stuff. Now, that doesn't mean that the TV shows haven't been good because I've, I've, I've actually enjoyed the TV and honestly, the production they've been able to in like post-production make it look like like a decent show audio still stinks the 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 lighting in the crowd you can't see anybody it looks like they're just all hanging out in an abyss right and then you they zoom in on the same 10 faces every week so you know there there's those issues but i i felt like it's looked a little bit better the last couple of weeks um but um again look you know i i i have not gone hard like this in a, in a little bit but the situation uh doesn't doesn't look good um uh, and we're gonna we're gonna get into the uh, episode here and uh here in a little bit um but uh, the first thing i wanted to talk about was uh, the big news i think it's probably the top story that uh, miyu yamashita um is coming into tna She's going to be there at the uh, tapings after Rebellion. And I personally am excited about this um, because I remember when she had come in before and um, she did a really good job. Like she, I, she's a really good wrestler. She's Joshi trained um, and, and all of that. And that's, that's awesome. Nobody knows who Miyu Yamashita is <laughs> except for, except for, uh, except for me and a couple of my friends, right? Like me and Scott E wrestling. I don't watch. She's from Tokyo Joshi pro. So she's not even from stardom. Um, she's from Tokyo Joshi Pro. She does a lot. Um, she does a lot of stuff on the indie scene here in the States and, uh, she always does a really good job and, um, she's kind of a little bit popular on the indies, but she's not like a needle mover. Like, you know, they, they announced that Jordan is going to take on Mia Yamashita at the, the, the TV tapings, which kind of tells you exactly who's going to win the title or who's going to win the match at rebellion. Like we already know now, right now they could switch it. Um, and honestly, they probably need to get the belt off of Jordan because they have no viable contenders for her. So they got to build somebody, right? They got to build somebody. Um, and Steph Delanders might not be that person because she's, again, she's a per date person. And she might only be in for Vegas. Like they probably brought her in for one night, <laughs> one night in Philly and one night in Las Vegas and the whole thing because they don't have any trust in Ash by Botox to have a good match. And they we found out last week that that was the case, right? So, but, uh, yeah, so they're bringing in Miyu Yamashita. Um, I think this is, um, this is awesome, but Miyu is only in the States and she's actually going to be in the States until June. And then she goes back to Japan. So could, you know, 
could she beat Jordan at the tapings and then flip it back to her against all that, that's possible. I, I don't, I don't think they're going to do that. I don't. Um, I think that they're, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the, she's only in for like that taping, but you know, who knows, who knows what's going on there. Um, and, uh, but you know, the situation is so dire. I wanted to bring up this. Um, so, and yeah, Aunt Evans did a podcast with, um, with Eric Bischoff last week, and he uh, he had some words to say about uh, the modern TNA. Mentioned TNA, like so the four times last year, TNA was doing better on YouTube in terms of money and views. Like TNA, I, I love that company. I mean, you know what they did to my friend Scott Demore was was gross, and uh, the guy they got in charge now, Ali Schooner, I think is going to take them like the Titanic straight into an eye, iceberg, but. Four times last year, TNA was ahead of AEW. That's with AEW's roster and with their, you know, with 10 times as many people watching them on TV every week. That should not happen. I mean, yeah. So, Ant Evans, um, he, if you guys, um, have watched their, um, YouTube channel the last couple of years, it's Garrett Kidney and some other guys uploading uploading stuff to youtube but the guy behind the strategy um the guy behind them actually turning their youtube into a viable revenue stream was ann evans that's what he does that's what he does. he's a youtube expert um and uh, hold on lucha Doncic said that sounded uh that sounded 10 percent personal so yeah obviously he friends with scott demore so you got to take that into account but i i think i don't think that we can completely discredit his opinion um, because he worked closely with TNA for a long, for a couple of years. Um, and with Anthem, he was the guy that brokered the deal to, for Anthem to be able to buy Invicta. Um, that was, that was him. And, uh, Invicta has a presence on YouTube because of Ant. And so, um, he, he is the reason why the YouTube is a major revenue stream. And the purpose of that podcast was, um, to a talk about AEW missing on their YouTube stream. He said that AEW is probably making two to 3 million a year when they should be making eight based off of, based off of their popularity. Um, and he said that uh, TNA is, is like a seven figure is a seven figure uh, venture right now with their YouTube stream. And that it's growing exponentially. And they're actually in a lot of cases doing better than AEW, despite the fact that AEW has like 10 times the viewership and they're like 10 times as popular. Right. So, um, so a, I wanted to talk about that because I think that, um, they could be even doing even more with their YouTube. And, um, but first he, he said it straight up, this guy, Ariel Scherer, who, who Ant clearly worked with at Anthem. Um, he thinks that he's going to, he's going to tank the company. And, um, so far not looking good, <laughs> not looking good. We'll see. We'll see what rebellion ends up looking like. We'll see what rebellion as far as, a, you know, not only ticket sales, but pay-per-view buys looks like, and we'll see about what these, um, what these live events coming up end up looking like, but like not looking good right now. Right. Um, you know, not looking good, but, um, let's get back to what he's saying about the YouTube. I think it's, it's. Uh, and I, and I actually like me and him had like a little bit of a back and forth on some of this stuff. I think, I think it's time for impact to go back to what they were doing with Twitch, right? Where they were on access and Twitch at the same time. Okay. Um, but I think they need to be on, uh, on access and YouTube at the same time, but on YouTube for free. I really do. I, I don't think that anybody's not going to not sub to their ultimate insider because of, because of losing access to the show. I think like me personally, I, I'm a YouTube ultimate insider because for a couple of reasons, a, um, I don't like the ads, right? I don't like ads and I can get the show ad free. I just got to wait a little bit, you know, 30 minutes longer and I can get the show without any commercial breaks. Right. And, uh, not only that, I get the, um, not only that, I, I, I get the monthly shows and that, and that's really what you're paying for. I don't think they need to have, the the membership tier where they only where you only get the TV show just get rid of that and have the monthly have the tier with the monthly show um, and then give away the show for free um, and then you can still have the ad free version on their Ultimate Insider I think that's the way to go and then but then you start the show right at eight right at the same time as Access that way everybody's having the same conversation at the same time 
And, you know, during commercial breaks that, that are on uh, access, you can just put fucking movie trailers, right? <laughs> or, or ads for Invicta or, you know, cause you know, and whatever ads you can find like blue chew, like <laughs> whatever, like whatever low level stuff you can do, you just fill the commercial time with that stuff. Right. I think, I think that's the way to go. Cause I don't think they're going to be, they're going to do a good job of getting people to spend money. Um, but you can grow the popularity of the show right now. I think more people would be more willing to give TNA a shot if it were free. And that, and that like people are not going to want to pay for it. And nobody, nobody has the channel, right? Nobody has the channel. So I, I think, I think they can, I think they could do that. Um, and, um, and Lucha says TNA plus two. Yeah. They, they could put the same feed on TNA plus that you would put on YouTube um do it there load it up with ads um but as ant was saying and um gerard gerard is saying this um so now i suggest that suggest the tna plus he said that they're thinking an app can do more than the streamer than the number two streamer in the world so it's not the number two streamer it's the number two search engine in the world youtube is the number two search engine in the world right and they do a very good job of leveraging their youtube popularity and turning that into a viable business um, and they could be doing more. They could be doing better. I think it's, I think it's been long enough time. Look, I think they had a show like a week or two ago that was in the top 50 and it was like 85,000 views 80, or 85,000 viewers. So it was something ridiculous like that. And then Ant told me, he said, whenever TNA is not on access only averages about 6,000 viewers at a time for like for shows, right? That's ridiculous. And they're not doing anything to improve that. Now they've got bare knuckle boxing coming up and they might get some, but bare knuckle boxing is not that popular. It, it, it's not, they're not doing like good business there. That, that, um, you know, trailer, trailer TV owns that, that trailer TV is like a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> so the guys that own trailer, they bought fight, um, and they have all this hedge fund money coming in. Um, eventually that whole thing's going to blow up. Right. And then they ended up buying BKFC, Bare Knuckle Boxing, and now they have a deal with uh, Fight Network and with Access, and um, it might do some viewers, but it's not, it, you know, it's not going to do anything crazy. Um, and then earlier this week, Access, you know, they put Carney Wilson, Carney Wilson guys, from Wilson Phillips, who had one hit back in like 1990. Hold on with Wilson Phillips. Carney Wilson, she is the daughter of Brian Wilson from the Beach Boys. And don't ask me how I know all this stuff. I just know, okay? And she has a show where she's going to eat food. And that was like, that's like their big thing coming up. They're also going to do like a, a heavy metal type show. You know, we thought there was going to be a lot of crossover with TNA, um, TNA going forward. Well, they are bringing in a wrestler to do a show on Access talking about heavy metal. She just happens to be with NWA. It's the Mariah lady, Jugs O'Plenty, BQ's favorite wrestler over on NWA. She's coming over, not to TNA, but to Access. So, you know, they didn't want to give that spot to Rosemary or somebody <laughs> or somebody on uh, TNA. They, they gave it to Mariah. Or what, what's her name? Got Maya Gomez. Something I can't remember her name, but um, she's on NWA. So, so that's what they're bringing over. So, like staying on access and then trying to charge people for your, your weekly TV is not going to help you grow. They got to just give it away again. And Twitch was not going to grow because nobody goes to Twitch to watch wrestling. People only ever went to Twitch to watch nerds play video games, right? Like that's what Twitch is about. And they, they quickly, they found that out eventually, right? They could not grow their stuff on Twitch because that's, it didn't really fit in with what Twitch is. And Twitch is nowhere near as popular as YouTube. Nothing comes close to YouTube. And so they they found that out. They realized that the hired ant ant you know bolstered their YouTube. <clears throat> and now it is a viable business for them. I think it's high time that they go straight to YouTube. Okay. I got a couple more things to talk about before I get into uh, get into the episode. Um, Matt Hardy, he um, turned down AEW's offer for a contract extension or like it's a, a renewed contract or whatever. Um, that's according to Matt Hardy. So now he's a complete and total free agent. 
I think he's probably going to try to sign with WWE. I just don't see it. Maybe he can be a producer there. Um, I, I honestly think he ends up here, and I've talked about that a couple of times. I know BQ's talked about it on his show. I think he ends up here. And um, and guys, I'm going to get to you. I'm going to get to Lucha and uh, Gerard in the chat and Dre too. Um, so so bear with me. I just had stuff on my head. Um, I think I think it's only a matter of time before he comes to TNA because he still believes in that broken hearted character. And this is probably the only company that's going to let him do it. Um, can they go back to that well and make it a success? I don't know. But that was, like, as far as a success on television, the last time there was success on TV was when he was there. Um, he was actually moving numbers for them over their baseline, right? Like, um, oh, way over their baseline. So um, that was, like, the last true television draw that they had was Matt Hardy. And they brought people in, and there was tons of interest. And of course, you know, Anthem buys the company, and um, they um, they they couldn't work out a deal. And uh, the Hardy Boys went back to uh, back to WWE. Um, and the rest they say is history. There was a lot of heat there, but I know the heat has been squashed. In fact, Matt Hardy, whenever there was a partnership between AEW and TNA, um, Matt Hardy actually came back to TNA for an episode with a or two episodes, with a private party, private party. Right. Matt Hardy was their manager and brought him in and private party <laughs> could not lose on DNA. They had to put him in a three way and uh, to where they lost the match, but they didn't get pinned because uh, Tony Khan was trying to protect fucking private party because <laughs> so that, that whole that whole relationship was hilarious, by the way. Well, a swig of coffee. Um, so, yeah. So yeah, uh, Matt Matt Hardy, I think uh, definitely definitely is coming. Um, Natalia and Jordan Grace continue to tease having a match together. Um, this is in light of Nick Khan discussing his interest in working with other companies and reports of TNA and WWE having a meeting over WrestleMania weekend. Um, I I don't know if it's going to happen. Uh, I doubt that it's going to happen, but I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility. Like you know, it, we're in a weird time in pro wrestling right now with WWE as the leader. And them seemingly wanting to work with other promotions, which is not something that they've done in a very, very long time. You know, Jordan Grace went to the Royal Rumble um, and did very well there. Or Mickey James went to the Royal Rumble a couple of years ago. Um, they have sent talent to All Japan. They sent, um, and the same guy, Charlie uh, fucking Dempsey, I think. Yeah, Charlie Dempsey. They sent Charlie Dempsey and Shayna Baszler over to Bloodsport. And Nick Khan was in attendance. So um, these things can happen. And TNA is no threat, right? So I don't think that, um, you know, it's the craziest idea. Um, and if they were to do something, my prediction would be it would be Natalia versus Jordan Grace. Um, but where would they do it and how would that would work out? I, I That I don't know. So, um, but they keep teasing it. Natalia is going to be a free agent here pretty soon. Um, or at least she's like her contract expires here pretty soon. So I don't know if it's, um, I don't know if they're going to resign her or not. I assume they will. You know, she's kind of a lifer there. But maybe she'll become a free agent. Maybe she'll work some dates in TNA. I don't think AX or AEW would actually pick them up, and I don't think TNA would have the money to sign her. But if they wanted to bring her in for a couple of dates to do a to kind of do a big match with Jordan, I I, I could see it. Um, I, I I don't I don't think that's the craziest thing. Um, but yeah, they keep teasing the match, so I I guess anything anything is possible. Um, all right, let's get to the chat here. Um, Lucha says, uh, "Give me power slap on access," uh, and then. Um, Gerard says Anthem couldn't afford uh, Anthem couldn't afford Dana. So Power Slap is over on Rumble, and uh, they're getting pretty good money there. But I could see because um, so Bare Knuckle Boxing is they're not getting like the live like first run episodes of Bare Knuckle. They're getting like reruns, right? So could they get reruns of Power Slap? Probably, probably. I I, I don't I don't like i don't think i don't you know it doesn't work on TV. Like they they crashed and burned when they were on a major channel. So, um, I don't, uh, I don't, I don't think that, uh, I don't think that's going to happen, but I don't, I don't see it like not happening. You know, like, I'm not going to like, oh, that will never happen. I don't, I don't, I don't see why that couldn't happen. Um, what would it help to, would it help access? Probably not. Probably like, I, I don't, I think access is at a point now where I just don't think that there's anything they could do to, to, to grow that brand. And we and we've been having this discussions like they've been saying for five years that they're going to grow, they're going to grow, they're going to grow, and they've only ever 
done the opposite, right? Like, and now they're not even on Verizon Fios in a lot of areas. I know they they up their stock on Xfinity in a couple of areas where they're, they're now like on the same tier as like TNT and TBS, but that's only in a couple of areas. So um, they took some steps back by getting off of Verizon and they took a, like a step forward within some markets um, stepping up on, uh, on Xfinity, but yeah, uh, I, I don't, I don't know. Um, I, I, I just, I don't know. I'm not looking good guys. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to be completely too dire. Um, but I, I think that's just the way the, that's just the way it, it's gone. It says, uh, the YouTube insiders would still be in behind the episode and because that free. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Gerard. And so Lucha asking about ant, said uh is he no longer with the company no he would not be bearing the company the way he did if he was still with it and jory says i think he's an independent contractor or something currently helped bischoff and conrad maximize our youtube channels so so um ad free shows that whole network um the youtube thing he's redoing the whole thing and um specifically with bischoff like bischoff to where like he's doing live episodes every week on youtube now and more than that, more than more than one a week, and to where he actually, he essentially fired John Alba from their show, and he's doing solo shows right now, and he's doing them on YouTube, and I think the audio probably goes to their Patreon, um, but he gets to do it on um, on YouTube, and they're doing they're like, I'll be honest, like, I don't want to say anything nice about Bischoff, but like his YouTube is fucking blowing up, and it's because of Ant, right? The guy knows what he's doing. So whenever he talks about YouTube, I pay attention. So because I'm like now, now that I'm getting ads on YouTube, I'm in the YouTube business. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm going to pay attention to stuff like that. All right. Um, yeah, I don't think I had any other news. Yeah, there's not really, like I said, there's not really much going on in uh, the world of TNA. So let's get to, let's get to the, let's get to the episode. And so um, this episode was built around Monsters Ball featuring PCO and Khan. So if you wonder why I'm a little bit down on TNA, <laughs> I, think you have, I think you have your answer. Because I and I didn't feel like this was a bad episode. And honestly, that match at some point it does pick up a little bit, but like not not good. Like they're actively putting out something that they know is bad, putting it in the main event. Because they don't fucking care what you think. <laughs> but they have yellow bone saying con is good. So they're like, okay, look, here, this guy. This one person likes it. So here we will put it there. So okay. All right. Let's get into the uh let's go ahead and get into the show. Impact open with Hammerstone and Josh Alexander beating the hell out of each other. So this is a great way to start the episode with my two favorite guys in the company. Um, well, and Steve Macklin. I don't want to leave out Steve, but um they open with Hammerstone and Alexander beating the hell out of each other, and uh, with Alexander being busted open as security attempted to intervene, but weren't very successful. Tommy Dreamer made his way to ringside to calm Alexander down, told him to get out of there. And then Dreamer gets his fat ass into the ring, cuts a shitty promo, um, doing the Gettysburg address again, um, like the super impassioned, like nobody cares about what you're saying promo to Hammerstone. So that they were in front of the best fans in the world and uh, Hammerstone was in Tina wrestling because of him. Dreamer told Hammerstone that there was too much going on uh, tonight for them to be brawling before rebellion. Uh, Dreamer told Hammerstone to head to the back, but as Tommy was heading out of the ring, Hammerstone uh, hit him from behind and put him up in the torture rack in what, what I would call the greatest feat of strength in the history of wrestling. Um, never seen anything like it. This is right up there with like Mark Henry lifting a vehicle. So, but yeah, he got uh, Tommy Dreamer or Tummy Dreamer, as Lucha Doncic would say, Tummy. He got Tummy up in the torture rack. Um, and uh, I love the torture rack. I think I think Hammerstone needs to start using the burning hammer though. So you can get him up in the torture rack and then just fucking do the flip thing, the reverse, you know, um, Kenta Kobashi burning hammer. I think they should go with it. I think that would be cool. And his name's Hammerstone. So why wouldn't you use the burning hammer as your finish? He also has a nightmare pendulum, but I think like torture rack and burning hammer combo would be good. Uh, I think that would be perfect. Okay. And then the show kind of falls off a cliff here. Um, we got crazy Steve. Crazy Steve defeated Laredo Kid by disqualification and retained the digital media title. So Laredo Kid hasn't won a goddamn match, <laughs> but he does an interview with Tom Hannafin. And so now he's got a title shot and he loses or he went, uh, yeah, he loses by disqualification. I get the feeling they're going to run this back. Oh, and Crazy Steve um, looking for bookings 
during Under Siege weekend. I think Laredo's getting this title because <laughs> I don't think I don't think Crazy Steve's going to be around much longer. I think his deal's probably coming up, and they're not going to keep him around. So, um, so yeah, the match wasn't good. The finish was wonky. They're trying to do something with Laredo Kid, but the one thing that they're not trying to do is get him to win matches. Because who is he going to beat? They don't want him to beat anybody. <laughs> so, so he ends up getting disqualified here. Um, but they'll probably, probably beat Steve, and then Steve is going to go back to NWA or wherever he's going to go. I don't know. But uh, I hope he sticks around. I like Crazy Steve. I'm like one of the few people that's like, I kind of dig Crazy Steve's mask and character, and I like his theme song, and um, I, I dig the whole thing. So I, I like Steve. I don't want to see Steve go, but, it, you know, look, he's 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 like begging for bookings during Under Siege Weekend when he has a contract with a company that happens to be working that same weekend. So tells me that things aren't going great there. Um, then it was announced that against all odds this year would take place at Cicero Stadium in Chicago, Illinois on uh, Friday, June 14th. So tickets going on sale Saturday, April 20th. I'm going to make a prediction. Um, MLW is, MLW is going to outdraw um, Impact in that same stadium. And I think they run it in like April or May. I think, I think it might be like gears coming up here pretty soon, but MLW is bringing in CMLL talent. And so they're going to have all their guys, but you know, like a lot of the top CMLL people are going to be there too, and they're probably going to pack that place out, and they're 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 definitely going to outdraw uh, TNA, despite the fact that TNA has a written agreement that we have not seen play out. We have not even seen we have not other than Vikingo, we have not seen another uh, and Laredo Kid obviously we have not seen another AAA talent on the show, but uh, they have an agreement with AAA, and would they just haven't used it or that was fake, and which I'm thinking was probably fake. Um, but yeah, I, I think MLW is going to outdraw them, honestly. And backstage, Alex Shelley apologized to Chris Saban and Kushida for wanting to do a thing on his own, and that said the time machine was much greater as a unit. Saban and Kushida accepted his apology and agreed with him. So that whole two month storyline that they had going on, it's over. Well, because they're leaving next week. Now, first class, uh, they go on to defeat ABC in what I thought was a pretty damn good match. I liked this match. And you know we can say whatever we want about AJ Francis, but I thought he uh, I thought he held his own in the match. Um, I thought it was very good. He works good with these smaller guys. They make him look like a monster, and uh, that which is good. And so I thought it was awesome. And then um, you know Rich Swan got the got the distraction roll up, pull the tights, victory, which is fine. Like I hate the finish typically, but I thought it was fine in this match. Um, I think Swan looks good as a heel here, and I think he's kind of found some new life, and so that's good because he's been spinning his wheels for a long time. Here's the problem. Afterwards, Joe Hendry comes out, calls uh, Francis Uncle Phil, gets some cheap heat there, and the crowd goes crazy for it. And they set up a match between Hendry and Swan. I so that so that doesn't make any sense. They they form this new tag team, they give them a win over the former tag team champions, and at the pay per view, they're gonna do a singles match with Joe Hendry and the Rich Swan, and that's not even the feud. The feud is AJ friends. I I know Rich Swan like you know turned on him whatever, but the feud is AJ and Hendry, and it's been going on since Hard to Kill, and it started at Hard to Kill in Las Vegas. And we're still not getting the payoff to the feud. It would be better if Hendry had a tag team partner and they did first class versus Hendry and a tag team partner. But instead we're getting Hendry versus Swan. Like that doesn't make any sense to me. Like why are we creating a new tag team and then on the pay-per-view putting them in a singles match? Doesn't make any sense to me. Um, it's like right hand, left hand. They don't know what they're doing. Um, backstage, Santino Morello was met by Ash by Elegance. And uh, and George Iceman, they say that Ash was ready for a knockout title match of Rebellion, but instead of agreeing to make it happen, uh, Morello left him hanging. So they said, hey, look, their replacement won the match, so she should get the title shot. Um, I don't know, man. I don't know about that. Backstage, Ali was with the Grizzly Young Vets, and Ali vented that his match of Rebellion should not be taking place before Jake something interrupted and stated that the match was indeed going to take place. And then Jordan Grace and Steph DeLander have their contract signing. Um, this was okay. I don't really like contract signings that are too played out, and I didn't really feel like it was necessary here. But I guess you know you do got to build Steph Delander because nobody gives a fuck about her. You know she's not been on TV, she's never won any matches on TV. 
um, except for the one. Um, so I think she won a match in Australia. So, and nobody cares about her. So I had to bring in Matt Cardona to like kind of give her some heat. But I thought that uh, Jordan Grace had a good line here. Um, Grace put over her own accomplishments before uh, Cardona took offense to Jordan's claim about digital media title. Delander then stated that they didn't have enough time to talk about her, all of her accomplishments, but Grace countered by stating that she's beaten her before, beaten her boyfriend before, and then beaten her boyfriend's wife before. And I thought that was a pretty good line. Um, and then um, as Cardona was going nuts and the fans were chanting um, the B word, Grace finally signed the contract. Grace and Delander shook hands, but as the aggression was high, a brawl ensued naturally. And after Morella was knocked down and out, Delander put Grace through a table before posing with the title. And of course, Matt Cardona was like attacking the Grace too. Um, so I, I think it was okay. I, I don't think it's going to do anything to get anybody interested in the match. Um, I really don't. But, you know, I, I could be wrong. Um, Backstage, Masha Slamovich was interrupted by the system that Eddie Edwards stated that her and Alicia couldn't make a great tag team. Slamovich then gave them an answer in Russian and left. Uh, I hope that her tag team partner ends up being Miyu Yamashita. I think that would be a viable team. But, yeah. Then a video, uh, this is good. A video promo aired focusing on Jonathan Gresham in a boardroom full of people. Um, reflecting on, the, on uh, the masks he wears in life. So talking about his personal mask, his mask to the ring, and all of that. Um, I don't know where this is going, but hopefully we get there soon. Um, you know, they, they have an uphill battle to make um, Jonathan Gresham interesting again. You know, because when he came back, he, there was nothing interesting about him. I was like, hey, this guy's a really good wrestler. Okay. Like a lot of people are. So where's the money? So hopefully we're we're getting we're getting somewhere. Um, and then we get to the next match. Moose beat the shit out of Trent Seven. I like that. <laughs> I don't think Trent Seven should be winning matches in this company. So and Moose just beat the shit out of him. Trent Seven is one of the most physically unimpressive wrestlers I've ever seen. He looks like if uh, if we we're in like mid Atlantic in 1980s, he would definitely be standing in the ring, you know, waiting for Ole Anderson to come down and beat the fuck out of him. So got some charisma though. Um, after the match, the system entered the ring and looking to do more damage, but Mike Bailey uh, entered the ring as well. Bailey was cornered quickly, and after he managed to hold his own for a second or so, the system was on the attack. Before they could inflict too much damage, Time Machine hit the ring to make the save. Uh, backstage, Santina Morello was interrupted by the system, who were angry about what just took place. Morello stated that the system would defend the World Tag Team titles next week against the Machine Guns, and the winners would battle Speedball Mountain at Rebellion. Morello was then interrupted by Decay, who stated they wanted their rematch for the Knockouts World Tag Team titles at Rebellion, in which Morella agreed. So we only have two tag teams, so naturally one of them has to get a title shot, and it was the former champions, Decay. Um, and then we go, uh, so I like this whole next segment. I think they've been building, so like my favorite feud in, uh, in TNA right now is Hammerstone and Alexander. Like I, I like, I really like that one. My second favorite is Ollie and something. So we get to Jake something defeating James Drake. Um, something immediately used his power game early. Yeah, he 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 beats he beats him up, you know, fairly easily. I would say it w wasn't like a squash, but it was like a glorified squash. Um, after something had Drake set up in the corner, he went to the opposite corner, but Gibson grabbed the leg, allowing Drake to hit a running drop kick. Gibson then followed up by choking something with a scarf as Drake distracted the referee. This was enough to ignite Cody Diener, who hit ringside to even up the odds. Diener took out Gibson, and something followed up by nailing Drake with into the void to get the one, two, three. And then after the match, although this was cool, Mustafa Ali came down with a bunch of protesters. Um, because the protesters were protesting the fact that something is in the division because he's too big. I, I just think that's funny. Like <laughs> it's like a good heel thing to do. So they're coming down to ringside to protest. And uh, as they come down to ringside, Jake something dove over the top rope out on everybody um, and then grabbed Ali himself. And then um, the young vets would cover, recover. However, and nail something with hit the, with a grit your teeth and Diener attempted to make the save, but after he was taken out, something was finished off as well. And Ali and the grizzly young vets proved to be too powerful. So um, I like the whole segment. Um, they're, they're doing a good job of making Jake something look like a monster and a viable contender to Ali. I think Ali keeps the title, but I think the match is going to be very good. And then we get to the main event and uh, I don't know what they're thinking, man. I, so 
I'm going to start with the positives. There's two positives. After a while of being dreadful, I I did feel like towards the end, the match had picked up just because they were like hurting each other. Right. Um, these, these two guys, they don't, they're not very mobile that, you know, but, um, con, um, did some dangerous stuff. And then, uh, so, and obviously PCO did a bunch of dangerous stuff and then, you know, they did the thumbtacks, that whole gimmick and they, you know, falling on the apron and killing themselves. So they did that like towards the end. I thought that was kind of like exciting. Um, but it just took a while to get to that point. Here's the ultimate positive. I, I think that con might be done because they did three matches and con lost three times. So, um, cause I think they did the match at, um, no, I think they only did two matches. Yeah. Cause they, no, they did, they did one match where it was, um, a, where Khan got disqualified and then they did another match and PCO beat him. And then this was the third, I think I could be wrong, but I think, yeah, they did three. And I think BQ brought this up in our Brace for impact chat that they wrestled three times and Khan lost all three times. Well, Khan should not have been winning. So they did the DQ to get to the second one. And once they got to the second one, it should have been over at that point. Or they should have went straight to Monsters Ball. But what they did need to do was drag it out another month and then do a main event, Monsters Ball, between the guys. Because nobody ever had any interest in this to begin with. Ratings are down. Ticket sales are fucking dead. And this is the shit that you guys put on your TV and you wonder why you're in the state that you're in. That's just, like You get what you deserve at that point. You deserve to lose when you do that. So, but they did, the match did pick up at the end. I do think Khan is gone. Um, so add him to the list of people that are out with this new regime. You know, Dango has, was not in Philly. He hasn't been around in a while. Oleg, uh, clearly gone. I think we're going to see a lot of those guys move to the, uh, you know, off the roster page here pretty soon. And maybe we'll get some new fresh blood. I talked about the tag team last week's, uh, Saint and Center or, um, Jobber and Taint is what BQ would call them. Um, I, Mike Santana very clearly going to be at Rebellion. They should probably go ahead and announce that, get some type of excitement. I don't think that you need to get the excitement pop for him. Just announce it. Announce that he will be there. Um, you don't need to work that thing because you got to get people in that building, right? And he might be able to get some people a little bit excited. Um, but he, again, he's not a draw either. Um, and... Um, you know, and, may, and you know, if they got Matt Riddle, if they got Camille, they might want to just announce that. And if they're going to be there at Rebellion, they might they might want to just announce it and tell everybody. But um, that was it. That was it for um, for TNA. Um, so thank you guys. Thank you everybody in the chat for talking TNA with me. Now I'm going to uh, close the show. In fact, I'm actually going to switch my branding because I'm going to try to clip this for YouTube. Um, let me see here. Switch the branding a little bit. Boom. So, um, I just before we went live this morning, I watched or I finished watching New Japan's Windy City Riot, and um, I thought it was a very good show. They had like six over six thousand people there in the Wintrust Arena in Chicago. It was the biggest like um, stateside New Japan event that they've ever like promoted themselves. They did the co-joint event with Ring of Honor um, at Madison Square Garden WrestleMania weekend that one year, but um, Outside of that, this was the biggest that they've ever done because they did an American Airlines Arena a couple of times, but they were like around three, four thousand in there, and it looked bad. And they also did the Cow Palace again; it was like three or four thousand. So they went to Chicago, the Wind Trust, and they did over six thousand uh, with um, John, obviously with a lot of help from AEW. You know, John Moxley was in the main event. They had Jack Perry um, on the show. Eddie Kingston was on the show, and of course they had a couple of TNA stars. They had a uh, well freelance stars but they're still on tna they had the x division champion must have Lee, and they also had um um nick nemeth on the show so um it was a very good show like as far as like their new japan stateside stuff um since um they've created new japan strong this was the best produced like the video quality was great the audio quality was great i wish they would have lit the arena because they had so many people but they didn't light the arena so it was very dark it was so but it was um, a better produced show than you will see on TNA by far uh, or MLW or N NWA. And honestly, from what I have seen the last couple of years, they were typically worse, right? They, they would use like the cheapest production equipment possible for these new Japan, new Japan of America shows. And they were always pretty like the shows, like the wrestling was always very good, but they were just unwatchable, but you can tell they've actually put some money into this and they've hired a good crew and it looked very good. 
um, and you had know, Walker Stewart and um, Chris Chris Charlton, and then they had Veda Scott. Veda Scott was not very good on this. Um, I, honestly, I thought she was pretty bad. Um, I, I I did not enjoy her commentary on this one, and I know that it's kind of mean to say that, but she just wasn't very good. I didn't think. I thought I thought she actually broke up the 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 good vibe between Walker and Chris Charlton. Like she just kept interjecting herself, and I just didn't think she had anything to add. Um, and then I just don't think her voice was very good. I don't know if there's something going on with her voice, but I just, I mean, she actually sounds like what she normally sounds like, but it just didn't work for this. I just didn't, I just didn't think she was any good. So, um, you guys can cancel me for that if you want, but I just, I'm sorry, she wouldn't, she wasn't any good. So, but I thought the show was very good. Um, I, I, um, I watch, you know, I should probably pull up the, pull up the results, but I did get to watch a, a good bit of it. And um, I was really impressed with how they did everything and uh, obviously really impressed with the ticket sales they were able to do and the matches they were able to put together. Um, they did, they did very good, but um, let's see, let's go to the, let's go to live results. I'm not going to do a full blow by blow, blow play by play, but I just want to pull up the live results just to, just so I can remember. Cause as you guys know, my memory is not very good. Uh, the first match was uh, Matt Van Griff defeating Zane Jane. I did not watch that, but I did watch Alex Windsor and Trisha Dora defeat um, Mina Shirakawa and Viva Van. Um, I, I thought I thought this was pretty good, and Windsor got the Windsor got the pin to Van to win the match. So, which you know pays off a little bit later, as we're about to get into. Then Ren Ren defeated Minoru Suzuki. Man, Suzuki just cannot win to save his life. <laughs> but look, he's he's coming up on sixty years old. So, but again, this was, uh, this was, uh, you know, pretty good. Um, but they're, they're trying to push Narita and I, I get it. Narita is one of his young, one of their young talent on the come up. So, um, and then we go to a uh, new Japan strong women's championship. Stephanie Vaker, uh, defeats Azumi AZM for you novices out there. Um, and I thought this was a very good match. Stephanie Vaker could be a big star. So could Azumi, but Stephanie Vaker. Um, could absolutely be a huge star in the States if she were to get picked up by one of the bigger companies, um, which I think is probably going to happen sooner rather than later. She's, I think she's CMLL. I'm pretty sure she's CMLL. But um, after the match, Alex Windsor, who got the pin earlier in the tag match, see booking, um, met Vakira in the ring to challenge her for the strong title. Vakira accepted and setting the match up for the next show in, uh, I believe, in May called Resurgence. So. Um, then we get to the New Japan Strong Openweight Tag Team Championship. Uh, TMDK of Mikey Nichols and Shane Hayes defeated the, the Grills of Destiny, <laughs> which Tama Tonga is no longer in it, nor is uh, Tonga Loa. It was uh, El Fantasma and Hikaleo. Um, uh, and Fred Rosser and uh, Tom Mahler's a team in the West Coast Wrecking Reich, Reich Crew of Jarrell Nelson and Royce Isaacs. I'll be honest, I was not a big fan of this match. Um, I just wasn't, but... TMDK holding the tag titles. Um, that's that's kind of cool. Um, you know, they, they were big in Noah before they signed with the WWE and they went to WWE and the career kind of died. You know, there was a lot of um a lot of injuries happened and uh, they the team broke up and then you know once they both got their releases, you know, they they've been in New Japan and they haven't really done much. You know, they haven't. But um, but here they are as the New Japan strong tag tag team champions. Those kind of like their C level titles. So now we got to get into um, which was the most compelling match of the show by far. And it was Shota Umino defeating Jack Perry. Now, that, remember, they're in Chicago. So Jack Perry comes out, and he's wearing a Chicago flag, and he's got a jacket on, and on the back of the jacket it says, Cry Me a River. And these, this crowd just ate it up. And honestly, JD was in the crowd, and he said it was like 50-50 because people liked the antics, right? And they were a little bit on his side. Um, and then the, the CM Punk faithful were booing the shit out of him, saying all kinds of vile stuff, and he was eating it up. Now, could this lead to, could this ultimately lead to like a Jack Perry push in AEW? Well, I think he's going to get a push. He's probably going to go join the, the Young Bucks. In fact, I would not be shocked to see him join the Young Bucks next Sunday night at Dynasty and help them win the tag titles over FTR. I think that's happening. Um, but this match was so compelling because of, you know, Perry's interaction with the audience and how hot they were for the match. Cause he was like, uh, if, for the most part of, uh, a, a, a heel, like a chicken shit heel and the crowd ate it up. But then there was a lot of people that supported him. There was even a, uh, a, 
they were singing the song, Oh, cry me a river. So that song was going on in the audience. And then there was a big chant of, uh, you got choked out. And then the other folks would counter with, no, he didn't. Um, and he did not get choked out. He got his head squeezed for a couple seconds. So there was that. He ended up uh, uh, trying a go to sleep on him, and that got a ton of heat. Um, so, he, But here's the problem with it. It worked in Chicago. It's probably not going to work anywhere else, right? Now, they're going back to Chicago. AEW is going back to Chicago several times this year, so the, could that like be his gimmick? Hey, I'm in Chicago. I'm going to get heat. Or is he going to have to do something more interesting? And does he have the charisma to be more interesting in other places, right? Like it worked here. This is like, hey, the, the CM Punk interview was two weeks ago and AEW pulled their stunt on Dynamite this week. So it's still fresh in everybody's minds, right? Um, can he do the anti-CM Punk gimmick everywhere and, and can it be? Can he make him some money? I, I don't see that. And you're also, if he's going to go around doing anti-CM Punk stuff and the scapegoat stuff and all that stuff, you're trying to build to a match with a guy that is, you're not ever going to have a match with, right? So how does that translate into business for AEW going forward, right? Are you going to have FTR defending the honor of CM Punk, who in AEW is a heel, and FTR is the baby faces, right? Like that that doesn't make sense. So it's, it's short-term success, and it was very successful for this show. Will it pay dividends everywhere else? They're about He's probably going to return to AEW in St. Louis, St. Louis and Chicago are rival cities. I, you know, the Cardinals hate the Cubs. Cardinals fans hate Cubs fans. When he goes there, he might actually be a babyface, right? So, what's that dynamic going to look like? I don't, I don't know. We, we got to see. What well, I don't know what the plans are going forward. But right now, he's building to a match that ain't never going to happen. He's getting heat in Chicago, and that's fine. But can he get heat anywhere else? Uh, that I don't know. Because what that video showed to me is he got he's a little bit of a chump, right? He talked some shit and got pushed around a little bit, you know, and uh, that that was it. So, um, but can he, you know, he's a, but can he carry the chicken shit heel stuff and make it work? I think he, he maybe he could. I still know he has a charisma to pull it off everywhere else. It didn't take much for him to get heat in Chicago. It was very cheap stuff. And I, and look, and I applauded. It worked. Like if you can go for it, make it work, go for it. And he did. Um, but can it work anywhere else? Remains to be seen. I do think when he shows up in uh, shows up in uh, St. Louis for Dynasty, you know, it's probably going to get a big pop though. Um, after the match, Perry offered Umino a handshake, and Umino accepted. So yeah, he looks like he's very much done with New Japan, and he's going to be heading back to AEW imminently. Then Mustafa Ali defeated Hiromu Takahashi. So X Division Champion Mustafa Ali de- defeated Hiromu Tak- Takahashi. I found this to be a very good match. Uh, Ollie's super over in Chicago, which bodes well for against all odds coming up in Cicero Stadium. Um, that should be helpful for uh, for TNA to to draw there because uh, this crowd was all over. They were eating up Ollie, and Ollie was kind of playing the heel, but they were, you know, they were. It's his hometown, so they were cheering for him. Um, but a very very good match. Uh, Ollie even bled a little bit, and then after the match. Um, Takahashi had a, a new Daryl doll that was like filled with muscle. It was like a jacked up Daryl doll, and they shook hands. Yeah, oh, also after the match, as uh, Takahashi was leaving, Ali was holding his X Division title, and he looked at Takahashi and was pointing the X Division title, and Takahashi shook his head. I think that match is coming to TNA at some point. That is if TNA and New Japan are still working together, because if you notice, ABC, they have not been using the Bullet Club stuff for since the beginning of the year, honestly. And um, I think they did it hard to kill, but I think like shortly after hard to kill, that was over. And um, they're actually about to break up. So they have not been using bullet club branding in a while and they're about to break up the tag team. And we've seen Kevin Knight on, uh, on TNA, but we have not seen any other new Japan stars in a while. Cause she just signed with impact or signed with TNA. So um yeah, I don't, I don't know, I don't know if that relationship is still kind of, you know, as strong as it once was. Um, so w- we'll see, we'll see. You know, people will say, oh, well, Ali and Nemeth are on the show. Ali and Nemeth are freelancers. So, but it would be cool to see Takahashi on TNA. And then we go to uh, Gabe Kidd, Kenta, Clark Connors, and David Finley. The Bullet Club uh, defeated Eddie Kingston, TJP, 
uh, Jeff Cobb and Homicide, Team Kingston. Uh, this is just a big, big, fun brawl. Did all kinds of stuff, forks and all kinds of nonsense. Craziness ensued. Bull Club wrapped the chain around Kingston, setting up something for Diabolical. Homicide tried to make the save, but Finley cut him off with a shillelagh strike, and Kid then hit Homicide with a pile driver to win the match. After the match, Kingston initiated another brawl. Both teams continued to fight for quite a while. So, just chaos. Once teams are separated, Kingston challenged Kid to a no-ropes last-man-standing match for a resurgence. So, they're keeping this feud alive. And then we go to one of the best matches of the night, surprisingly. Uh, New Japan World Television Championship. Zack Sabre Jr. defeats Matt Riddle, the champion. So Tanahashi beat Zack Sabre Jr., then Riddle beat Tanahashi, and Zack Sabre Jr. then beat Riddle. So they've been bouncing this title around a little bit. Um, there hasn't been much blowback to Riddle like being in New Japan, but a lot of the New Japan fans don't want him there. I would not be surprised if Riddle was gone, honestly. Just my gut. I, I could be completely wrong. He could be announced for a resurgence already, but, um, but a riddle. So, and another reason is because riddle lost, right? Um, and it was a roll up victory. Um, but it was a very good match. Like I loved this match. I thought this match was incredible. One of the best matches I've seen all week. Um, but after the match, riddle rolled out of the ring and then just boom, just walked out unceremoniously. And, uh, it looked like, looked like he was done with new Japan. That, that was my gut watching it live. And um, they didn't even really like kind of acknowledge his reign or anything like that. Like they just went right into the next thing. And um, once Riddle was gone, Jeff Cobb came into the ring and challenged Zack Sabre Jr. So it looks like that's going to be the next uh, challenger. But yeah, it looks like Riddle is gone there. I'll be honest. I would not be surprised if uh, he heads to TNA. I, th I think he's been wanting to go there. I think TNA was waiting to see if there would be a big social media protest uh for riddle in new japan and there just really hasn't been although a lot of new japan fans don't like him they don't like the fact that he beat tanahashi and up until this point he has not been impressive but i did think that this was like his best match in new japan so um but it looks like yeah it looks like he is done and then we go to nick nemeth defeating uh, tomohiro ishii and uh which was a very good match too i i love this um you know this was an ishii match and i think nemeth Having an Ishii match bodes well for Nemeth. This was one of his better matches that he's had since he's been out of uh, out of New Japan. Now, I'll be completely honest. Um, I have not watched his indie stuff, so I can't tell you if he's had good indie matches, but I can tell you about his stuff in Impact. He's had some pretty good matches. Um, and this this match right here with Ishii is the second best match that he's had that I have personally seen since he has left WWE. The first one being with Steve Macklin, and I'm not kidding. Macklin, that was the best match that he's had since he's left WWE. It's the best match he's had in, in years, honestly. Um, this one did not beat it, but I still thought it was very good. And me putting, comparing it to it and, and putting it right up there is a high compliment for me. So I, I, I did love the match. Um, but Nemeth got the danger zone to pin Ishii. And then we go to the main event. John Moxley defeated Tetsuya Naito in a bloodbath. Well, I mean, Moxley was bleeding, of course. At one point, Naito hit Moxley with a, uh, with a chair. And he was bleeding all over the place because it's Moxley. Moxley likes to bleed. That's what he does. But um, very good match. Great way to end the show. Send the crowd home happy. Um, a lot of New Japan fans are worried that an AEW wrestler is now their champion. And I and I get it. I understand it. Um, but I think that New Japan fans are not willing to acknowledge the fact that New Japan is on its ass right now. And they need to do something to pick up business. And it looks like John Moxley is committed to New Japan at this point. I'm sure he's still going to be in for the major AEW shows, but AEW took Osprey. They took Jay White. They And I, I say took. Their contracts were expired, and they signed them. If they did not sign them, then WWE would have signed them. Okay? So it wasn't like this was a raid or anything, but we got to face facts. A lot of the biggest stars in New Japan left New Japan to go to AEW. That's, that's what happened. New Japan's on its ass. The economy is not good in Japan. And um, so now Tanahashi and the New Japan leadership had to make a decision. So they worked out a deal, and now they have brought in John Moxley, who has been working there since he left WWE. So it's not like it's like a – like I know he's signed with AEW, but it's not like he's not a New Japan guy. He has been working New Japan since 2019. He's been in New Japan for a long time. And he is the former New Japan, I think, a United States champion and – all that. So now he's the IWGP champion. I'll be honest. I was not that impressed with Naito. 
in the like in this match and what I've seen of Naito this year, I've been, not been impressed. He he's beat up, he's out of shape, and he just can't go the same way he used to. And so they're bringing in Naito and hopefully and, and hoping it'll pop business. Uh, clearly, it pop business in the states having uh, Moxley as champion. Can it do the same in Japan? I, that I don't know. But th- those fans know Moxley very well. So this isn't like like what happened with TNA where you know Kenny Omega just shows up and win the title and then he doesn't drop it back to a TNA guy. He drops it to, to Christian Cage. And then Christian Cage comes in and drops it and we just never hear from him again. Like I don't think that's this because like Tony Khan and New Japan have a partnership. And I think Tony Khan understands by him signing all those people, he really, really hurt his partner. Like not on purpose. I think it was a necessity. He had to sign them. It was a necessity. If he didn't, like, they, they were not going back to New Japan. Okada straight up said, I'm not going back. I'm going to the States one way or the other. And if AEW didn't sign him, WWE was going to, right? So um, so I think this is kind of like a, hey, man, look, uh, you guys are on your ass. Let me send you Moxley. And Moxley was probably cool with it, right? Likes to, likes to go to Japan anyway, likes to work that style. So it looks like he's going to be in Japan for a little while. Um, I'm sure we'll see him at the big shows uh, for AEW, but he is a New Japan guy for the time being. And maybe this is the way to get Yoda Suji over. I don't know. Because I think eventually Yoda Suji has got to win this title because he's like their next guy coming up. Um, but I hope it doesn't end up happening what happened before, you know, with what happened with Impact where Kenny Omega got too beat up because he was working both schedules. And he was working AAA at the time. And he didn't drop the AAA title to a AAA guy. And he didn't drop the Impact title to an Impact guy. <laughs> he just he just handed over the AAA title. And uh, he, you know, got screwed out. I mean, he essentially got screwed out of the Impact title for Christian Cage. And then um, and then that, that, that was it. We never saw Kenny Omega again, right? So I don't think that's going to happen with this. I could be wrong. I mean, yeah, could Moxley end up getting hurt and then have to just give up the title and never lose it to a New Japan guy? Yeah, that could happen. I hope not. That could happen. It's going to be interesting to see how this whole thing ends up and plays out. Um, but New Japan is in a tough spot right now. Um, as far as you know, Forbidden Door coming up, Forbidden Door, people are more excited about CMLL versus AEW because all of New Japan stars are now in AEW. Right, so New Japan's gonna be sitting in the cuck chair for that one. They're on the outside looking in, and now their champion is an AEW guy. It's like Forbidden Door, New Japan versus AEW does not look interesting. They have to bring in now they're bringing in Stardom and they're bringing in CMLL. It's no longer an AEW versus New Japan show. Like th- those days are over because New Japan doesn't have anything to offer at this point, as far as name value goes. The biggest name person they have in their company right now is John Moxley, and he's signed to AEW. So. That's just the way it is. You know, people are calling it AEW Japan. I, I get it. I get it. Um, but I'm looking at it practically. I don't know if New Japan has any other options at this point. And maybe, maybe he'll get Yoda Suji over. Maybe. I don't know. Could be. But hey, guys, that's going to do it for me this week on uh, this episode of Brace for Impact. Thank you for sticking around and listening to my New Japan stuff. Um, I really appreciate it. And as I watch different shows, you know, MLW, if I, you know, next time I catch it, I'll try to do it during a, a brace for impact, um, especially on a week where there's not much to talk about with impact. But, um, but yeah, that's going to do it for me this weekend. Until next time, mahalo.